Well, if you're new today, I'd just like to remind you that we're a church. We go verse by verse through the Bible. We are studying the Gospel of Mark. We are in the second to the last chapter, and we've come to the event that history is all about, the cross of Jesus Christ. I want to remind you that uh, the reason we come to church is not to pat ourselves on the back. We're the good people, right? We're here because of the cross. We're not even here to make our life better. But I'm not going to lie to you. My life got a lot better following Jesus Christ. And I think if you're in the wilderness in your life, the answer is the cross, getting back to the cross seeing what God did for you on that cross, how much he loves you, you get that. It's bigger and better than anything you're chasing after in this life. It's bigger than, and better than anything you're complaining about in this life. The cross of Jesus Christ. Last time we were together, we looked at the mercy at the cross. And we saw if there was any time for God to be upset, if any time for God to be angry, this would have been it. But he doesn't seem to be angry with the people doing it. He seems to be bringing judgment on Jesus, and that's exactly what God did. And we'll see that even more now. So we saw the mercy at the cross. Today, I want us to see the miracles at the cross. Thousands upon thousands of people were crucified in the Roman Empire. But one crucifixion stands out more than all the others. And we see that here. Uh, We focused on Jesus' physical suffering last time, his emotional suffering, as the people he created mocked him. But now we're going to see the spiritual suffering he faced. Way beyond our understanding. Let's read verses 33 through 39 where we left off. It says, And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means... My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. Amen. So I want us to see some supernatural things that happened while Jesus was on this cross that Mark records for us. First of all, number one, notice the supernatural darkness. Verse 33 says, And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. From 12 noon to 3 p.m., when the sun is in the highest point of its apex, there was darkness all over the land. This wasn't a storm. It wasn't an eclipse. God brought darkness. When I first read the Bible and I read about the cross and I saw this darkness, I immediately thought, well, God's just making it dark because he's angry at what they're doing to his son. That's what I thought. 
But now, as I've been studying the scriptures all these years, and I see and understand exactly what was going on here, the darkness came upon Jesus. Darkness is always associated with judgment in the Bible, especially the Old Testament. When God sent the plague of darkness on the Egyptians, it was a judgment. And the scripture says it was a darkness that could be felt. God's brought darkness before and God's going to do it again. This Wednesday, we're going to be talking about it. Darkness that God will bring. And it says men will gnaw their tongues in agony because of this darkness. But the darkness came upon Jesus. Let's look at number two. Notice the supernatural departure. And this kind of goes with the darkness. It says, and at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma, sabachthani, if I'm saying it right. I've heard so many different interpretations of that. It's Aramaic. But here's the important thing, which means... My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Now, I think the Elijah part here is just more mockery. As God the Son is taking upon our sin for all of eternity, it's being placed on him. People are still mocking him. Maybe Elijah will come and save this pathetic Messiah. But the important thing about this is to understand what, what was going on here when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the first time Jesus ever prayed this way, calling his father God. He always called him father. Abba, father, in the garden, he prayed, take this cup from me. And this is the cup he was talking about, this moment here. Because somehow... Beyond our comprehension, God the Father separated himself from God the Son. Now, when, when something happens beyond our understanding, I think the more we try to explain it, the more we get it wrong. So we got to be careful. And uh, I want to do my best not to say something false, not to say something that's not true. But basically, to understand this, you have to understand, first of all, the Trinity was never broken. That would be impossible. So what happened here? Um, we say that hell is separation from God. And that's what hell is. God will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Uh, scriptures talk about you'll be out of the presence of God. God is omnipresent. That means God is everywhere. Okay? It means God, God's spirit is in hell as well or he's not omnipresent. He is everywhere. But God is able to separate you from him so you cannot have a relationship with him. You cannot be in his light, and so you get darkness. 
And God was there. God was there at the cross. A lot of times I hear people say, well, God had to look away because God can't look upon sin. That is a figure of speech. The Old Testament says God, can, God cannot look upon evil. It doesn't mean he can't see it with his eyes. He doesn't look with the intent of being tempted by it. God looks at sin with judgment. If God can't look upon sin, I guess he can't see nothing that's going on in this world, right? No, God sees it all, but he's not tempted by it, and he will bring judgment upon it. And so this is what is going on. Jesus is facing the judgment of our sin. And at that moment, God the Father separated himself from the Son as all of our sin, all of our eternity of sin for all who believe would be placed upon Jesus. Scripture says he he who committed no sin became sin for us. Jesus never became a sinner. Jesus never ceased to be God. Listen, Jesus became a man because he had to be a man to be the sacrifice for man's sin. But he also never ceased to be God because, listen, only God would be able to take an eternity of sin in our place and be able to endure it and put it upon himself. And that's why Acts says God purchased the church with his own blood. John Calvin said this, he bore in his soul the terrible torments a condemned and lost man. But dare we on such hallowed ground seek more clarity? Calvin says, Jesus felt the torment of a condemned man, a lost man in hell as God moved away. And it was a, it was a realm Jesus never faced before. And so he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And we talk about how the, the disciples forsake him. And now God has left Jesus all by himself, bearing the sins of the world. A supernatural departure. Do you realize what Jesus went through for your sin? You know, we, we complain about what sin does to us. We complain against each other of what your sin has done to me and my sin has done to you. Do we realize what our sin did to Jesus in this moment of time? As for these hours that he was on the cross bearing the sins of eternity for all who would believe. A supernatural departure that's really beyond our understanding. Number three, notice the supernatural death. Mark 15, 37, it says, and Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. I've been around death being a pastor. And most people on their last breaths are barely able to say anything. They can't cry out. They can't say anything loud. Yeah, maybe the days before they cry out or, or they're, they're in pain or whatever, but on the last moments, 
But Jesus, on his last moments, uttered a loud cry. If you remember last time, Jesus refused the painkillers because he was going to take the full blunt of our sin. But he did taste this sour wine. And it was enough to moisten his mouth because we saw in Psalm 22, by the way, Psalm 22 starts out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So Jesus was fulfilling prophecy. And that psalm we saw was about crucifixion where it says my, my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. Is someone on their deathbed, what do you do? To, to a nurse or a loved one puts, tries to put ice on their lips or that little sponge to moisten it? And Jesus' mouth was moistened by that wine vinegar because he had some important things to say right before he died. And he was showing once again, we're seeing the supernatural strength that Jesus had. And Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down. And even in this moment, Jesus was saying, I am giving my life away. No one takes my life. I love it. John 19, 30. Everybody needs to get this. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, when Jesus had received the sour wine... He said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Luke's gospel says, as he bowed his head, he said, into your hands I commit my spirit. In other words, I'm going to go ahead and die now on my terms. But he cries out with strength. And he moistened his lips to say one thing that we all need to hear. It is is finished. Nothing else needs to be done for sin. Nothing else has to be done to earn God's love. It's taken care of. You know, I hear people, there's some false teachings out there that say, well, Jesus had to go to hell because he had to go to hell and suffer. No, no, the hell, the hell was on that cross when the father separated himself and All the sin was placed upon him. So where did Jesus go when he died? Yeah, he he went to hell and he took the keys. That's what he did. He took the keys. I'm in charge now. And anybody that comes to me does not come to this place. But it is finished. Do you know that? You know, the devil doesn't want you to know that. Some of you don't know that. You just feel like you still don't do enough. There's still more you got to do. And you need to understand, Jesus said, it is finished. And, I'm, I'm, you know, people, there are people in the world that will try to tell you it is not finished. I got, I got all kinds of people trying to put pressure on me. People that say, you know, you're not doing enough for God. We should be doing this, and we should be doing that. I got some email from some guy saying that the church is failing and the church, you know, putting all this pressure. I wanted to just email him back and say, listen, it is finished. Quit putting pressure on me. You know, off my case, potato face, something like that. (laughs) Pastor Adam said to me last week, he goes, hey, Frank, do you ever say things in your sermon that nobody knows what you're talking about except the old people? You know, the young people don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. I say I do it all the time. I do it all the time. <laughs> the devil will put pressure on you. People will put pressure on you. You'll put pressure on yourself. And our Savior says, it is finished. No more pressure. No more sin. You're my child. You believe in me, you're my child. You are forgiven. It's a done deal. You believe in me. You have crossed over from death to life. That's eternal security. It is finished. This was a supernatural death. 
God accomplishing his supernatural finished work on the cross. Number four, and number four kind of goes with it. Notice the supernatural destruction. Verse 38, and it says, as Jesus died, it says, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. What is that all about? This curtain that was in the temple was very, we know it was at least 30 feet high. The writings of Josephus says in the newer temple that King Herod built that it could have been up to 60 feet high. It was very thick. Some people say it was four inches thick. The Bible really doesn't say. We don't know, but we know it was a thick curtain. People would say that even horses, two horses couldn't pull the, the, the curtain apart. And I think people say these things because they try to make the miracle more spectacular that this temple curtain was torn in two when Jesus died. But the spectacular part was not that the curtain ripped. The spectacular part was what God was saying. We know that there was an earthquake that happened. And the other gospels tell us but the curtain, an earthquake would have tore the curtain from bottom to top. But this curtain was torn from top to bottom. Why? Because God tore it. What was this saying? What is going on here? You see, in the Old Testament, that thick curtain separated everyone from the Ark of the Covenant where the presence of God was, where the mercy seat was, where the high priest could, could go in once a year. Only one man could go in there once a year. And if you didn't do it right, you'd get struck dead. And you didn't want to mess around with that Ark of the Covenant. And we know a guy named Uzzah one time that tried to touch the, the Ark of the Covenant from stumbling, and he was struck dead. You didn't want to mess with it, okay? I know the, the, the show Indiana Jones was science fiction, but they got the point right. You don't want to mess with God. And what God was saying in the Old Testament with that curtain, you are sinful and you have to stay out. You cannot come into my presence in your sin or you will die. And God said, you must, if you want your sins forgiven, you must bring a blood sacrifice. And so that high priest would go in there and he would offer blood sacrifices for the people's sin. And the people couldn't even go in there. The priest had to do it for them. And God is saying, I am holy. You are sinful. You must stay away from me in your sinful state. But when Jesus died and he, when Jesus said, it is finished, what was God saying? God ripped that curtain and what, you know what he's saying to us? Come on in. Come on in and receive my grace. Come talk to me. Come pray to me. Your sins have been dealt with. Your sins have been forgiven. You're my child. Come and be in my presence. But folks, listen to me. Apart from Jesus Christ, a sinful person cannot go into the presence of God. That's how big of a deal this is. And I want you to think about this for a moment. If there was any other way to get to God, if there was any other thing we could do to get to God, why would God do this to his son? Why would God put his son through hell if, there, if we could be good enough on our own, if we could be religious enough on our own? I'm telling you, there is no other way. This is the only way to God. 
And if you come to Jesus Christ and if you ask him for mercy and to forgive your sin and trust in that finished work that he did, you will enter God's presence and you can know him now and have a relationship with him now and you don't need a pastor and you don't need a priest to get to God. You go, how comes there's, why are there still priests in our world? Because they don't read the Bible. That's why. You don't need anybody to, to come to the presence of God. If you're a child of God and you've trusted in Jesus Christ, you have access. That is the good news of the gospel. And here comes a guy who sees what it's about. Notice number five and finally, notice the supernatural decision. Verse 39. And when the centurion, when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Luke's gospel says this, this centurion soldier added he was innocent. Matthew's gospel tells us that he saw the earthquake. He saw the events surrounding the crucifixion. He saw all these miracles firsthand. And his eyes were opened. And his heart was softened. And he became a believer in the Son of God. You know, when we open Mark's gospel, the first verse said, this is the gospel. This is the good news of the Son of God. And the whole gospel is about Jesus being the Son of God, and you need to believe in him. But all through this gospel, nobody gets it. I mean, the demons get it. The demons get it. They call him the Son of God. God the Father speaks from heaven. He calls his his son, the son of God. Peter, finally, finally, Peter, the leader of the disciples, right? Finally, when we get through half the book, he finally says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. But why doesn't anybody else get it? And finally, somebody gets it. Truly, this man was the son of God. I love this. This is a Roman centurion, meaning he's in charge. This is the guy in charge of the crucifixion. He's in charge of putting the nails in Jesus' hand and feet. He was in charge, and he allowed all the mocking to go on and the ridicule and the scorn. He was in charge of of crucifying God the Son. But Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that prayer was answered for this man because this man got saved. And this man's going to be in heaven. He crucified Jesus. His sin put Jesus on that cross. He literally put Jesus on there. And so did our sin. But when our eyes are open to the truth of the gospel, and when our heart is softened by the love of the gospel, and we say in our heart, truly, Jesus is the Son of God, we'll be saved. And we don't have to be afraid of that darkness. We don't have to be afraid of that separation. And God, God will remove himself. And there'll be, no, there'll be no way to have a relationship with him if we hold on to our sin and we don't embrace the Son of God. If you walked in here today, you're hearing these scriptures, you're hearing this for the first time about the cross. Maybe like this centurion, you haven't really gotten it.
But today you're hearing this scripture and the spirit of God is working on your heart. You're hearing it with your ears. In this moment, you admit to God you're a sinner. And you admit to Jesus that he is the son of God. And he bore this, your sin on that cross. He took the hell you deserve. So you could go to heaven. And all you have to do is embrace it. And here, let me, let me close with some good verses that, that come with this, what we've studied here this morning about the cross. Hebrews chapter 4 says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. Just saying that those who truly believe, we're going to hold fast to, we know that Jesus is the Son of God. And he's now, he's no longer on a cross because he was taken down and he rose from the grave to prove that the cross was the only way to God. And we'll talk about that, re that resurrection. Verse 15, but here's some good news. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. That's saying that Jesus is our high priest. Jesus is the one that gets us to God. And Jesus understands our pain, our suffering, our sin. He was tempted in every way we are. We give in to temptation, but Jesus was without sin. He traded places with us. It's the great switcheroo. We deserve the hell, and Jesus took it for us. He lived the perfect life we couldn't live, so we switched places. And Jesus lived that perfect life, but then he died in our place for our sin. In verse 16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. It's a fancy way of saying God loves us so much for God so loved the world, for God so loved you that he gave his one and only son. If you need mercy, if you need help, if you need grace, it's saying, go straight to the throne. Go straight to God. You don't need anybody else to get you there. In this moment, you can bow your head and go straight to the throne of God. And he will hear your prayer through his son, Jesus Christ. That is good news. That is good news. That's why we sing. That's why we're able to pray. And that's why we worship. Let's talk to him now and worship him in prayer and in song as we close.